Well, I've already told you this morning we are continuing in John's Gospel. We've finally uh, gotten through the introduction, which was full of the theme of the Gospel, which is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen what it is that John is setting out to prove. Now we're, we're going to move from that introduction to his first witness, you might say, uh, to who it is Jesus uh, truly is, and that is the testimony of John the Baptist. And I'd like to read that for you as we begin in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34, which is also our text this morning. This is what uh, John, <coughs> the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, writes concerning John the Baptist. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Uh, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now again, John has been telling us in his introduction that this one who came into the world almost 2,000 years ago was no uh, mere man. He is the Son of God. He is the only begotten God. He is the one who was with God. He is the one who created the universe. The one who is in the bosom of the Father, which means the one whom the Father loves more than any other. John has told us that Jesus came to reveal his glory. The glory that he had as the only begotten from the Father. He came to explain what the Father is like. What it is the Father wants. And Jesus did that through his teaching and through his preaching. But he also did that through his personal obedience to the law of God. To show us how it is the Father wants us to live. Uh, John says that he came to reveal his Father's love for us. By providing a payment to his Father's justice. By offering himself on the cross uh, for our sins, so that he might provide grace, that the Father might be merciful to us, that he might forgive us of our sins through faith in his Son, sins which would have weighed us down into hell. Now, when we see this living example of, of the law of God, when we see how Jesus lived and we compare our lives to his life, we can easily see how short we fall of what it is that God calls us to be. There's no way that God can let us into heaven on our own. We see that we deserve hell. We see that we need God's grace, that we need His mercy, that we need His forgiveness, that we need a righteousness to cover our sins. But John is telling us that that is exactly what the Father has provided in Jesus. Jesus. 
Remember, perhaps, uh, you know, some of the most memorable words in the Gospel of John. Jesus came that he might realize or in him might be realized the grace of God. Jesus is full of truth and he is full of grace. In him, John says, God gives grace instead of grace. That is, grace that replaces the grace of the Old Covenant. In Him, there is grace heaped upon grace. In other words, a grace that is much greater than that which was revealed in the Old Covenant. As Charles Wesley puts it in one of his hymns, Plenteous grace with thee is found. Grace to cover all my sin. And when you compare your life to that of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see there is plenty of sin. But there is a greater grace in Jesus that is able to cover over that sin if you will only trust him. But John also wants us to know that there is not only grace to forgive sin, but there is also grace to overcome it. That Jesus is the one who is also able to give his spirit who can break the hold that sin actually has on our hearts. And that is what John, the gospel writer, now shows us through the testimony of John the Baptist. Now I think by this time John's ministry has been in progress for about six months. Obviously many people were coming out to him to be baptized. Uh, Whether you saw this or not, Jesus had already been baptized and had gone out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's why when John first speaks, Jesus is not there, and yet John already knows who he is. Now at this point, the leaders of the Jews sent their representatives out to learn more about John, who he was, and why he was baptizing, and undoubtedly in order to find some grounds to accuse him, to to get rid of him as well. But here we also see John doing what it was he was sent to do, and what it is that the Lord actually calls all of us to do to point others to Jesus Christ, to to point away from yourself, as John pointed away from himself, to Jesus, in order that those who hear him might receive his salvation. Not only forgiveness, but power over sin. In other words, power to turn away from sin and to do what is right. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is consider two things from this passage. First of all, that John is the messenger of the Lord, but secondly, that he came to point the way to Jesus. So first of all, let's consider that John is the messenger of the Lord. Now, the question was asked of him, you know, who was John? Why was he baptizing in the wilderness? That's what the Pharisees wanted to know. So they sent priests, they sent Levites to him in order to ask him. Now the first thing that we should note in John's answer is his humility. Now we could certainly draw lessons from his courage that he was willing to declare the truth in front of those whom he knew had really an ulterior motive behind what they were doing. They wanted to find some grounds upon which to accuse him. But I think we also see in John's answer humility. What it was that John was really out there to do, what it was he was really after. And it was not his glory but it was the glory of his Lord. Now this is interesting because we do need to realize that even as Jesus had his time of popularity and then the time in which he fell into, uh, well, ridicule of course and, and the hatred of the people and eventually leads to his crucifixion. This was the time of John's popularity. People everywhere were talking about him. They were wondering who he might be. They were coming out to be baptized by him. He was getting a lot of attention. And usually when somebody gets this much attention, the tendency is because of human nature, because of sin, they want to keep that attention. And they want even more of this kind of attention. I mean, just look at the people in our own culture. Look at the celebrities that are all around us, how they're never satisfied with what they have, but they always want more, and so they're always pushing the boundaries of what's even been done up to that point, even beyond what's acceptable, to gain more attention. Sadly, the same thing happens in the church as well. Many of the so-called leaders of the church are also pushing the limits uh, 
the boundaries to gain more attention for themselves. I mean, really, the church has become a popularity contest. It's no longer about serving Christ, and that's one of the reasons why the truth is, is being downplayed, because it's not popular to preach the truth. It's not popular to tell people what the Bible really says because it's not very flattering to us, but it is very glorifying to God. Well, what does the Lord say that you should do when in his plan he turns the attention in your direction? Well, he tells you you need to humble yourself lest you find yourself in a situation where God is opposing you. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 6, and when he says this to your younger men, or to the young men, it, it certainly applies to all of us. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. The Bible says that God hates pride, that God is opposed to the proud. Is it any wonder why so many of these uh, shining stars in our culture actually plummet to the ground and are, are destroyed? I mean, they destroy themselves because they don't have God. They don't love God. They don't want anything to do with Him. And God is actually opposed to them because they will not subject themselves to Him. God is opposed to the proud. He'll, he opposes us if we should become prideful, but notice he gives grace to the humble. Now that's exactly what John was like. John humbled himself. He never would have been able to do what it is that the Lord called him to do if he hadn't yet first humbled himself. I mean, if he was looking out for his, his own life, his, what it is he wanted to do with his life, if he was trying to enhance his life, the last thing he would want to do is go out and preach against the Pharisees, preach against the Jews of his day, tell people that they're in sin, that they need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, John wasn't in it for his own reputation. He was in it for Christ. So as they come out to him and they actually ask him questions that he could use to turn to his own advantage, he tells the truth. He humbles himself and he exalts the one who is coming. Now, the first question they asked him was whether or not he was, in fact, the Christ. The fact that he was out there preaching, that he was out there baptizing, that he was making converts, that all Jerusalem, all Judea, and those who were living around the Jordan were coming out to him, confessing their sins and repenting and submitting themselves to baptism, it made them wonder whether he would claim himself to be the Messiah. Can you imagine how some of the leaders of religious movements today, leaders of churches would respond if somebody came up to them and asked, are you the Messiah, are you the Christ? I mean, I hate to think what it might do to them. But John humbled himself, verse 20, and he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Well, if you're not the Christ, then who are you? Verse 21, are you Elijah? Now, why would they think he was Elijah? Well, it's because the Lord promised in the closing words of the Old Testament that he would send Elijah before the day of the Lord. We saw in our meditation, Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. The Jews were asking, are you... John, the fulfillment of this prophecy, has the day of the Lord come? Well, John responds, no, not, not quite yet. Again, he answered, I am not Elijah. Now, I know that that statement of John actually causes some confusion because isn't it true that Jesus will later tell us that John is in fact Elijah? He says in Matthew 11, verses 11 through 15, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, 
John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now Jesus says that John is Elijah. John says he isn't Elijah. Which, you know, which of the two is, is right? Well, you know Jesus can't be wrong, so the answer, of course, is yes. But John isn't wrong either. The answer is no. The fact is, John is Elijah, and yet he isn't Elijah. He isn't Elijah in the sense that he's the actual prophet Elijah, because by this time, Elijah had been in heaven for many hundreds of years. He was taken up directly into heaven, remember, in that fiery chariot in the days of the kings of Israel. And let's not forget that Elijah is shortly going to appear with Moses to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's not John the Baptist, you see, that appears. It is Elijah. John was not that Elijah. And yet, he was the fulfillment of that prophecy about Elijah. In Luke 1, verses 13 through 17, listen to what Gabriel says to Zacharias when he is announcing John's birth. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." You see, John is that Elijah who was to come, but he is not Elijah himself. I hope that is clear. But again now, consider how John could have used this to his own personal advantage, you know, to sort of enhance his own personal prestige, but he doesn't do that. He denies that he is Elijah. Well, if you're not the Christ and if you're not Elijah, are you the prophet? Remember the Jews were expecting the Lord to send a particular prophet before the coming of the Messiah. And that was because of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your countrymen you shall listen to him. Now the Jews were expecting the Lord to fulfill that prophecy. And we can see that in the Feast of Booze when some of the Jews at that feast said about Jesus in John chapter 7 verses 40 and 41. This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Now who is this prophet that Moses was speaking about? was actually the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the prophet that God raised up from among his own countrymen, from among the Jews, to speak to them. Now Moses did say that they would listen to him, but that really only applies to a few. Only a few really did listen to him. And many more would listen to him, of course, after his death and his resurrection, because he did have to go to the cross, he did have to die, he did have to be raised again for their salvation, for our salvation. Many would receive him, but he is that prophet, and John is not. So again, John answers the question truthfully, no, I am not that prophet. Well, if you're not the Christ, and you're not Elijah, nor are you the prophet, who are you, he says, in, or they say in verse 22, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he says in verse 23, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So who was John? Well, he was the one that God sent in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for his prophet, for his Christ, for his son, Jesus Christ as God had promised through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. A voice is calling. 
Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now this brings us to our second point. You know, who is John? He is the one that came to point the way to Jesus. That's the reason why he was there. He didn't come to draw attention to himself, as we've seen, but to the Lord. The very same thing that the Lord calls each one of us to do. Not to draw attention to ourselves, not to seek glory for ourselves, but rather to draw the attention to him, because he alone is worthy. He alone is the one who can give life. He is the one people need to see. He is the one they need to hear. Now in verse 25, we see these priests and Levites had another question for John. Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Why are you calling people out to yourself? Why are you baptizing them? Now again, uh, baptism was not unknown in the Jewish culture, but the idea that John was, was making these disciples. Why? What, on what basis? What authority do you have to do this if you are not really any of these individuals? Well, he already told them why. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. He was the one who was sent to prepare them to receive the Messiah. One way he did this was by preaching repentance. It's very important, isn't it? He told them that they needed to turn from their sins. He needed to point their, their sins out to them so they would know which sins to turn away from so that they would know their guilt. You're never really going to trust Jesus unless you see your need of Jesus. You have to see it. But that's exactly why God gave the law. God didn't give the law to save his people. God gave the law to show them their need of Him, and that's exactly how the law is supposed to function. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. I mean, Paul said, I wouldn't even have known I was sinning unless the law had said, you know, you're doing something that's wrong. I wouldn't have known that coveting was sin unless the law would say, or unless the law says, you shall not covet. And when he read the law and he saw what it is that God required and he knew that he was guilty, he said sin became alive and he died. The, the law kills us, basically. It shows us we're dead because it's able to point out our sins, which is why we need the law, which is why the law needs to be ministered, which is why John was preaching the law. Now, does that mean we don't need the law anymore once we come to Christ? Is Christ the end of the law completely? Well, he is with regard to righteousness. He's the one who obeys it. He's the one who gives a perfect righteousness. But Jesus still points us to the law to teach us how to live. Because the whole purpose of redemption is so that we will stop sinning and begin obeying. That's how you know that you're a Christian. That's really the, the, the climax of, of even Jonathan Edwards' book, The Religious Affections. How do you know you really love God? It's because you obey Him, because you love Him, and that's what you want to do. You don't just love yourself and do what you want to do. You love Him, and you do what He wants you to do. You still need the law of God to show you how to love Him. But again, John the Baptist not only pointed to the law, which can only kill them or show them that they're dead, but he also pointed to the one who could give them life, the one who would give them the power to keep that law because that's not something you can do on your own. He says in verses 26 and 27, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, God sent John to minister baptism, a baptism in water, a baptism of repentance, and those who repented showed their repentance by submitting to his baptism. But what John's ministry was really showing them was their need to be baptized by the Spirit. 
Water baptism is a picture of spirit baptism. John came to minister the one form of baptism to show them their need of the other. And by the way, I should mention that that is John's baptism. That's not Christian baptism. That's not why we're baptized today. But this was a, you might say, a pre-Christian baptism. Those who were baptized by John had to be baptized again in the name of Jesus Christ. This is something a little bit different. But John was baptizing them in water, a baptism of repentance to show them their need of being baptized by the Spirit. But John is going to be the first one to point out that only Jesus can give that baptism. But where was he? Where was Jesus? Where was the Christ? John said he was standing among them, and yet he, he wasn't there. He wasn't there at that moment, but he had been, and he would be again shortly. Did they know who he was? No, and he had been among them already for 30 years, and they didn't recognize him. When they looked at him, all they saw was a man. But as we've seen, he is much more than a man. And certainly he had to be more than a man if he had the authority to baptize in the Spirit. I mean, the Spirit of God is not an impersonal force that one sort of calls down from heaven to zap people. The Holy Spirit is a person and he is God. And Jesus is the one who has the authority to baptize in the Spirit. He had to be more than a man. He had to be God. And here again we see John the Baptist is telling us that he is more than a man. This is his testimony. John said he didn't consider himself worthy enough even to perform the most menial service to him, which was simply to stoop down and loosen the sandals on his feet. You know, it's so common today to treat Jesus as anyone else. Jesus is my friend. I take Jesus wherever I go. He's my buddy. He's my peer. He's always with me kind of thing. Well, I hope you understand that Jesus doesn't want you to take him with you. He wants you to follow him. See, who's the Lord here and who's the servant? We're so prone to treat Jesus as our servant, but he is the Lord. There's a big difference between taking Jesus with you or following Jesus, and unless you understand the difference between those two things, you're never going to be able to please him. He must be the Lord, and you need to submit to that. Now, Jesus may not have been there at that moment, but the next day John had the opportunity again to point him out, as he had before at his baptism in verses 29 and 30. He saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now we talked about what that meant. He pre-existed John, and even though he was conceived six months after John, he existed before me because he is God. He is the eternal God. And John is saying, don't look at me. Look at him. Here is the one that you need, the one who is far greater than I because he existed from the beginning. Here is the Christ. Here is the Messiah. Here is the Lamb who will not only take away your sins, but will give you the power to break free of those sins if you will only trust in him. Now, how did John know all of these things? I mean, after all, he seemed to have been in the dark before. Well, he tells us in verses 31 through 34, I did not recognize him. That's why Jesus was able to stand around them and nobody knew who he was because he appeared merely as a man. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptized, baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now John knew him only because the Father showed him and the Father showed him so that he might point him out to the Jews. And the Father has shown you who he is not only that you might be saved, 
but that you might point him out to others as well that they might be saved. By the way, one thing we don't often recognize is when Jesus, or when John is saying that here's Jesus, he baptizes in the Holy Spirit. What does he mean by that? He means that Jesus alone can save you because you need that baptism of the Holy Spirit if you are to be saved. It shows that he is God, but it also shows that he is the only Savior of the world. This evening we're going to look at what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and how that really is salvation and how it also is basically the prerequisite to gaining the power that God has to give you to live the kind of life that he calls you to live. Jesus is, is not only going to forgive you of your sins, John says, he's going to give you power to break free from those sins. You need the Spirit of God if you're going to do that. And if you have the Spirit of God, he's already doing that in your life. Now let me just draw this to one conclusion and one point. I've already made several applications, but I just want to make this one in closing. Now, you and I do not have John's gifts. You and I don't have his calling. But you and I do have a command from Jesus to do exactly what John was doing. Not, not baptizing, but pointing, pointing to Jesus Christ. In Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20, we have the commission the command that Jesus gave to his church. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then something similar in Mark 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Well, that's, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? That's a pretty expansive command. Uh, can you and I do all of that? Well, no, we can't, but the Lord doesn't expect us to do it all. He only expects us to do what we can do. We can't reach everyone, but we can reach some. And that is one of the reasons why God saved us. Not just so that we would be safe from hell, but so that we might point others to Jesus so that they too might be safe from hell. In other words, the Lord wants us to make room in our lives to point to Jesus Christ. And I would go a little bit further and say this, the Lord wants us to make it a priority. People die around us every single day and most of them go straight into hell forever. Now it's true that some are going to do that because they've heard the gospel and they've rejected the gospel. They think they know better than God. They think they don't need it. They think they're okay. They think they're serving God already. They think their religion is good enough. They think there's many ways to God. There's all kinds of reasons. But you realize there are many people who are going to hell every day because they've never heard the gospel. That's true. There's a lot of gospels out there that really aren't the true gospel. There's people that are going to hell who may have heard some of it but don't understand it. Now, you and I can't make people believe in Jesus Christ, but we can tell them about Jesus. We can help them understand the gospel. We can point to Jesus. And that's something that we should do every time we have an opportunity. Jesus, the author to the Hebrews, says in Hebrews 7.25, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. He is able to save. But do you understand that he needs you and he needs me to point the way to him because that is the way that he reveals himself to other people. He wants to use you to reach the people you know. He wants to use you to reach the people who are around you. He wants you to point them to the law of God, to show them that they're sinners, but he doesn't want you to hammer them with it and condemn them. What he wants you to do is to, to do it in a gracious and gentle way, in a concerned way, out of love. You know the difference. That's the difference between treating somebody in a way you love them versus treating somebody in a way you despise them. Sometimes we, we do that to unbelievers. Sometimes we, we exhibit hatred and anger rather than love. But coming to somebody with the truth because we're concerned about it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to shake your hand when you're done. 
but at least you'll minimize that risk that they're going to hate you for it. It's something that needs to be done. He wants you to point them to the law of God so that they'll see their need for Jesus Christ and then he wants you to point them to him and tell them that they need to trust him. Now the Lord wants to use you and the Lord will use you if you will simply let him. And let me just say there's, there's no greater blessing than being used of the Lord in this way. Yes, you run a risk of somebody not liking you if you tell them the truth about their sin that they need to repent, if you tell them the truth that they're on their way to hell unless they trust in Jesus, even if you do it in the most gracious and loving way possible, they can still hate you for it. You run that risk, but you're still going to be blessed beyond anything you can imagine just for doing it because in doing it, you're not only you know, being used to the Lord, but you're actually doing what Christ calls you to do. That's what he wants you to do, to be his witness. Now, John was unique. We understand that. His purpose in God's plan was, was special. But what he was doing was not unique. That is also our duty. And so may the Lord help us to have love for the lost, to desire that those whom we know that do not know him, that we know are in sin, whether they profess Jesus Christ or not, if they're in sin, if they're practicing sin, they need Jesus Christ. They need to repent. They need to trust in him. It doesn't matter what they say. What matters is what they do, which is why on the day of judgment, the sheep and goat judgment were, were shown. It's not what they said. It's what they did because what you do is really what you are. If they're in sin, they need to hear that gospel. So may the Lord help us to love those people around us that don't know him by pointing them to the law and by pointing them to Jesus Christ. Now this evening, as I've already mentioned, we're going to try to understand a little bit more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and what it is that that gives to us and what it is we can do once we have that, once we are true believers. There, the Lord has made every provision for us to grow in our love and to have the power to overcome all of our fears and actually to do what it is he calls us to do. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. But for now, let's consider what he wants us to do is to point the way to Jesus. So let's pray. Uh, let's just spend a few moments in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and, and apply it to us, that we understand that this is what he wants us to do and that he would give us the grace to do that, particularly as we come to the table, because if we're not willing to repent of our sins, if we're not willing to point the way to Jesus Christ, then, then that's a sin that we need to repent of before we come to the table, because our Lord clearly calls us to be his witnesses. If we're not willing to be his witnesses, then we shouldn't come to the table. But if you are willing, remember there is additional strength and power at the table through Christ to help you do what it is he calls you to do. Let's bow in just a few moments of prayer and ask for God's grace.